Hi. Hi. Do you want to sit next to me over here? Okay. Do you think you like this thing? The idea that there's such a thing as a tortured artist prevails strongly throughout pop culture. It paints the way we look at visual artists like Van Gogh and Basquiat, or musicians like Kurt Cobain or Amy Winehouse and writers like Edgar Allan Poe and Sylvia Plath. We are transfixed by the tragic stories of extraordinary people and how that tragedy shows up in their creations. This treatment extends into not only the idea that ingenious creativity is linked to suffering, but suffering is necessary in order to access the high levels of creativity. It is necessary for creating profound and important work because happiness is dumb. Oh, you're happy? Well, you're a stupid baby, idiot. You're a stupid baby, idiot. As you might imagine, this is a narrative, hello? As you might imagine, it, this can be a dangerous narrative to prescribe to uh, an artist, but is it entirely a negative label? Is the idea of the tortured artist solely a bad thing. The more I thought about it um, for this video, the more I'm not exactly sure that it's completely black and white. And I think there are a lot of gray areas. I also want to get out in front of this video by saying, if you or a loved one has been diagnosed with mesothelioma, a serious and sometimes fatal disease, you may be entitled to compensation. Call me right now. Because I'm going to be talking a lot about like my experience, um, with this and kind of talking about my own suffering, um, which is pretty heavy. I want to say that I'm not digging for pity. Um, I really don't want people's pity. I wanted to share my experience as someone who's kind of been treated like a tortured artist. I, I think that's a somewhat unique perspective to share. And also I hope that sharing some of what I've been through um, resonates and makes somebody feel less alone or something. Yeah, hopefully somebody can relate to some of the stories I share. It just turns out they're all very tragic. This is what trauma looks like. Yeah, so be nice, please. Thank you. Um, also, um, I am recording this like 40 hours before um, I have um, my cervical spine fused. So it's kind of like hot on my mind right now, as you might imagine. Uh, I have been not doing well, <laughs> hence why I have not been present. Um, I have been struggling physically and I have, my condition is kind of deteriorating. So this surgery should fix that and I should hopefully be on track to um, getting back to normal again. Um, it has been the year from hell. So uh, just put that out there. Um, I'll already have had the surgery by this point. Um, obviously I'm not going to edit this in 40 hours. Guarantee I'm going to cut to myself, future Catherine, sitting in a neck brace in bed, being like, why the fuck did you leave this for me to edit and you didn't do it before because you put off shit because you were too busy playing fucking GeoGuessr and Stardew Valley. Hi, this is present cat with a message for past cat. And that message is, fuck you. Hi, present cat present cat here with a message for past cat for a message for past cat and that is dude chill okay you didn't even do anything anyway you just sat there in a neck brace and took a lot of drugs and did nothing so kind of cringe honestly yeah so now i have to do all the work me back to Past, past cat. Okay, wow. I really need to fucking chill out. Okay. Okay, anyway. All right, here's the video. Okay, bye. Are you interested when you're painting about whether the painting will talk in terms of pain or pleasure or 
And do those sort of things interest you or even enter into what you're doing at all? Well, I hope they'll look like a reflection of reality or recreation of reality. But you could say that reality, nearly all reality, is pain. I mean, if, you, if one wants to read it that way. I don't like to think of people... I don't want to think of people suffering, but then they do. Because they, they breed at such a rate that they're bound to suffer. So before we go any further, let's first define what I mean exactly when I'm talking about a tortured artist or the tortured artist trope. The narrative of an artist being tortured is typically applied to an artist, usually deceased, uh, that suffered from some sort of affliction in their life. This is like usually mental illness, typically like schizophrenia or bipolar or borderline personality disorder, but it could also be uh, physical disabilities, trauma, trauma, poverty, general suffering, and bonus points if they died tragically also. Their turmoil is often simplified, romanticized, or just sometimes factually incorrect to serve the purpose of creating a more fascinating and dramatic story that it makes experiencing their art seem more impactful and deep and important. As a result, their work is constantly discussed in relation to their suffering or as a direct result of it, or sometimes their art could be seen as the cause for their suffering. And thus they are either literally labeled a tortured artist or it is implied through this kind of treatment of talking about their life in a way that dramatizes their art. I will be the first to admit that I have romanticized the tragedies in artists. I think it's a very easy thing to do. The first artist that I ever emotionally responded to was Francis Bacon. His life was full of tragedy and hardship, which is something that I found out quickly when looking into his work and watching documentaries about him or reading books. There are some unclear facts about his early life, but we do know that he was born in Ireland and had seen the violence of the First World War at a young age. And he also had severe asthma from allergies to horses and dogs. They didn't know this at the time, and his dad trained horses for a living, so he would have frequent horrible asthma attacks where he was, like, struggling to breathe. And this is kind of ironic considering how notoriously chaotic and dusty his studio was. It had, like, no ventilation. And you can actually see his studio in Ireland. They, like, basically moved the studio into a gallery permanently at around 15 or 16 he dropped out of school and ran away or was kicked out of his home um, because he was gay. It's kind of unclear exactly what happened there because he kind of is an unreliable narrator of his life and would say very contradicting things about his past. We do know that he had a relationship with his father's friend at the age of about 16, friend of his father's uh, left his wife and kids to be with him. <laughs> Throughout his life, he had many tumultuous and violent relationships that were worsened by alcoholism and drug use. And one of his longtime partners, George Dyer, ended his life in their hotel room the night before Bacon's major retrospective, to which he still attended. This is kind of a, a, a slice through of what his life was like, and I think gives more context to his philosophies about life being pain, <laughs> basically. Looking at his art, it can feel like all of it was a direct response to the trauma he experienced. And I think Probably some of it is, right? Like, how much can we really divorce what we create from our lives completely? But the truth is that he, like, almost would never talk about the conceptual component or the meaning, the deeper meaning behind his art. He was very avoidant, and he was kind of an asshole when he talked about it and would make interviewers frustrated. So what is it that you're presenting when you've finished? Nothing except what people want to read into it. Nothing. He 
we would always say his art is about like unconscious uh, imagery that spoke to him and like things that were visually intriguing, but like, come on. The more violently, more strongly you feel about life, the more strongly you must um, be aware of death. I latched onto his work as a high schooler because for the first time I felt like I could see pain and true emotion and feelings that I have had experienced myself in art. Before that, there was never that like deeper connection to somebody's art. And this was so revolutionary for me. It was literally the reason why I wanted to start painting and the reason I went to art school and am honestly still an artist. It is hard to overstate the impact that it had. And as a result of this impact, I held on to the belief that it was necessary to turn my pain into something beautiful. And I think this assertion can be kind of adjacent to romanticizing suffering. I think they kind of go hand in hand of like making suffering interesting to look at for other people to experience, for other people to see. Or it's it, it's at least on the pipeline or primes the the romanticization component. I used his language of violent painting and intensity and abstraction as as a major inspiration for how I expressed my feelings. And for a long time, this was like really liberating and super important for my artistic development, I felt like, because it was so intuitive and impactful and seemed to connect with people, which I'll talk about. But I quickly got stuck in this pattern of feeling like I could only make art about sad or tragic stuff because I felt that art about joy or love or, you know, things associated with happiness were shallow and pedestrian, which I don't, I don't believe that today, to, to be clear. Before I transitioned from like 17 to 20, my artwork was a storm of anger and dissociation and pain and sadness. I was processing a lot of childhood trauma. Family trauma. Generational trauma. What? I had a traumatic childhood? You'd never be able to guess. <laughs> I spent the ages of like 11 to 18 not wanting to continue life and truly never thought I would make it to my 20s. It was something that I believed to be so true to the point that I almost dropped out of high school because I was like, it doesn't matter because I won't be alive. Art and painting specifically in this way really gave me like purpose and gave me a way to actually communicate my emotions. It was incredibly healing. It also felt like art was my only salvation from this pain. And I became obsessed. I spent all day, every day in the studio, which don't do that. I was so sick, um, like physically sick. I was unwell because I was not taking care of myself because I was literally so obsessed and determined and uh, uh, could not think about anything else or do anything else. I inflicted violence upon myself artistically because I hated myself so deeply. And it was this escape from my physical form and a release from the unchecked severe anxiety and depression I was experiencing. I realized that like, I do this thing, I really don't mean to do it. But anytime I'm talking about like something really upsetting, particularly with myself, but also I've noticed that I've done it in other videos where I've talked about something really bad. I just start like smiling or like laughing while I'm doing it like this. I really do not mean to do that. And my facial expression does not communicate how I feel about something. So if you see me like laughing or smiling about something, just know that that's the case. Unsurprisingly, it's been very off-putting to some people. <laughs> but yeah, making these paintings made my intangible emotional pain feel real. And it became something that I could look to as like a physical representation of that and say, see here, th this is it. This is how I'm feeling. It's real um, because I'm showing you. And like, it felt like I was getting it out and that it, other people could see it and other people could relate to it or not. This like anger 
and self-deprecation kind of turned into this like sad girl art routine when I started transitioning when I was like 20, uh, because that's when I realized that I was so uncomfortable with my body because I had ding, 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 gender dysphoria, baby. This pivot in sort of my identity and the art that I was making also came at a time where I started to gain traction for my art online and in kind of like the physical art world, I guess, a bit, but mostly online through like blogs that would write about my work or interviews that I did because I was ridiculous and I would just cold email people all the time to be like, here's my art. What do you think? <laughs> Which is the most obnoxious thing you can do, but it did work. But then this became like the only lens people viewed me through. It cemented people's view that I was this young, tortured artist who was suffering from the cruel existence of transness. I was sad and trans and that's it. And I got told I was so brave for what I was doing. And also that my art was heartbreaking, but beautiful. This followed me throughout my 20s as I was try really trying to make this my career. And it became clear like I would only get invited to shows or have something written up about me or get an interview or anything if it was about transness, tra being trans, or including me as a trans person in a show about feminism or or being a woman or, you know, a women's exhibition. And it became very frustrating. <laughs> it's like they wanted to either like watch me cry standing in front of the mirror while I put on lipstick or put me on a pedestal as a representation of the trans experience and pat themselves on the back for being so inclusive and having diversity. Tokenism. I was tokenized. This is kind of a weird tangent, but like I got denied from a women's exhibition because I was trans. Like they found out I was trans after accepting me and then like rescinded their offer. But like looking back, I can't necessarily point the finger at everybody else for viewing me this way, even if they were kind of missing the plot and really simplifying and making my, and pigeonholing me basically, because it's like something that I also perpetuated by continuing to agree to this stuff and continuing to market myself with transness being a big part of that. I didn't have to keep making art about sad stuff. I didn't have to keep making self-portraits the basis of my career, but I did. The problem became that anytime I wanted to make art talking about something else, talking about like love or my relationships or anything, nine times out of 10, it would not get the same reaction and the amount of attention as pieces that were about me being sad would. It seemed like I had to continue making these kinds of paintings in order to have a career. But like now when I try to make art from that place, that same place, it feels so inauthentic. Like, I, I, like I'm just picking at the same scabs over and over again for the sake of making art. So the work that was like so genuine and heartfelt and came from this deep place began to feel like a performance. I wasn't processing anything or getting feelings out or working through my suffering. I was synthesizing it. Being marketed as sad trans woman painter, that was not a purely negative thing. It had rays of positivity to it. My art became a mirror for other trans people and trans artists to see themselves in. Young queer kids felt represented and could relate to the art that I was making and were inspired by it. And that's not me like inflating my self-importance. I have been quite literally told that. It like genuinely is probably the best thing to come from like making art and having a career in art. Like that is so deeply meaningful to me. And I appreciate when anybody like says those kinds of things, like it has made all of it worth it. To have some sort of positive impact on a younger trans person is so deeply emotional because I did not have anybody to look up to. They're literally just were not trans painters. I had no model for how to like be trans and be an artist and like what that looks like and what I should do and what I shouldn't do and what's like bad to talk about and what's meaningful to talk about and 
I had no idea. I also literally did not know another trans woman. And I'm not saying that to be like, boohoo, poor me, because I was still, you know, I was still a white person from a middle class family in art school. Anyway, what I'm saying by all of this is that being packaged and pushed and put into this capsule of being a tortured artist, which I would argue is kind of how, adjacent to how I was labeled and how I was viewed and written about and my experience, I, I resonate with it. It is not purely a bad thing. It had positive effects, both in when I was drawing inspiration from artists and that part of their work really connected with me, as well as me connecting with other people and me having a career. But I think the big takeaway is that somebody being a tortured artist is not actually about their life or what they experienced or what their art is. It is everyone else's perception that is placed onto those things. It's other people's packaging of somebody's life, not the life itself. Does that make sense? Maybe that's not a very hot take, but like it changed the way that I thought about all of this, that it's that it's not a reflection of the individual. It is the reflection of how our society and people in media and people on the internet like to package things and simplify things to get more clicks and to get more views and to just make things more romantic or dramatic or fascinating or interesting. Like that's just what it is. Okay, scene change. Mama, come here, Mama. Like every other white girl who went to art school, Frida Kahlo is one of my favorite painters. She's just like so brave and I just love her. But for real, not only do I love her work itself, because it's amazing, I also really resonate with her struggles, and I feel seen in a unique way by the way she chose to depict the, the feeling of those struggles. Also, she's a bisexual communist icon. Listen, I am not <laughs> saying that I am even remotely close to as talented or artistically brilliant, or that my challenges were the same as hers or to the same degree as hers because I, they're not. They're just a fraction of what she's been through. I'm not that Delulu. At age 18, Frida Kahlo was riding a bus that was struck by an electrical street trolley in a violent accident. Frida was among the survivors, obviously, but she was impaled by one of the handrails going in through her hip and out her pelvis. She also had a fractured spine, shattered legs, a mangled foot, on top of, you know, being impaled. My struggles impale in comparison to hers. That's such a bad joke. I'm so sorry. Somehow she managed to survive, but she suffered from severe lifelong chronic pain and other very serious health issues as a result of this accident. She actually started really painting for the first time seriously from her hospital bed while she was recovering from this accident, which I think is really important in understanding how she developed her style and content, I think is is directly related to this. I really don't think her life and her struggles can be separated from her work. I, I don't think this is all of what her work is about. It's, she has work about many other things. In her paintings, they'll contain multitudes of, of emotions, feelings, events. But this accident and the health issues that she suffered from as a result were the inspiration for some of her most iconic paintings. She lets you in to what it feels like to exist in a body that can feel like a prison. You could argue that she was quite literally tortured um, physically rather than only suffering from mental health issues, which is usually the case with romanticized tortured artists. I know it's like to feel imprisoned in your body, 
which is why I think it's so impactful for me, especially certain pieces, like the broken column. She depicts herself wrapped in one of the medical corsets that she had to wear at different points throughout her life. She had many corsets and and casts, basically, that she, she wore and decorated. Internally, the column that is in place of her spine is crumbling. Nails are stuck all over her body, another metaphorical representation of her physical pain. She's giving Jesus a lay. I feel this painting so deeply, it like hits me so hard because I have a taste of this kind of reality and what this feels like. And I feel like she sees me or I can see myself in her paintings. And that kind of mirror is so profound and can make you feel more understood and less alone and give you a different way of thinking about your own life experiences. And I think that's so impactful. But in in relating myself to her and seeing myself in her work or feeling like she sees me, I edged dangerously close to romanticizing her pain and suffering. Okay, um, I'm gonna take this neck brace off now. I just had it on for dramatic effect. Um, I don't need to be in this right now. I have surgery tomorrow, so I don't actually need this. This is my shower neck brace. I'll be wearing that after tomorrow. Also, I need to be laying down right now because I literally can't sit in a chair anyway. Okay, you wanna come here, sweetie? Oh, okay. It's time for cat massage. Yeah, you might be wondering what the fuck the deal is with <laughs> these giant oxygen tanks next to my bed. These oxygen tanks are not used for anything involving my lungs. I don't have any illness affecting my breathing. I suffer from a rare primary headache disorder called cluster headaches. It is not super rare, but it's it's fairly uncommon. It is a neurological issue where your brain and trigeminal nerve basically go haywire and send pain signals to one side of your face around your orbital bone and your jaw. And this is some of the worst pain that a human can experience. And that is not a dramatization. In a recent study of cluster headache patients, they rated the pain of cluster headaches higher than things like childbirth and flesh necrosis. There's like no words that that can describe what it feels like. But the closest thing for me, it just feels like, like my head is in a vice grip and it's just being cranked and, and actually crushing my skull. It feels like somebody is crushing my skull. If you want a taste of like what the kind of pain it feels like, go to 7-Eleven or whatever other people have um, and go get yourself a slushy. Give yourself brain freeze. You know that feeling when brain freeze comes on and you are like incapable of doing anything else other than experiencing the pain and you're like basically paralyzed? That is like what I would rate as a three out of 10 on my my personal pain scale that I use to log my cluster headaches. It, just imagine that going on for an hour. Um, and that's, that's what it's like. And these can happen multiple times a day for up to six weeks for me. This is a really groovy move. Those six week clusters, that's why it's called cluster headaches, can show up twice a year for me, but usually only once a year. And it, they usually happen at the same time every year and they start for absolutely no reason. They can be sort of brought on by by stress. Don't think about things that will stress you out. Some people believe or some things can trigger it. But essentially it comes out of nowhere, happens, and then just stops for no reason. <laughs> it just, your brain's like, okay, I'm done now. I feel like I'm being senselessly tortured by my body for no reason. So much so that people often refer to their cluster headaches as almost like a another being like people call it like the demon or the beast that's like the common word because it feels like this this outside invisible force is inflicting torture on you it completely destroys your life um when it's happening 
You are you are non-functioning. I have a Bass Pro Shops chapstick. Part of my beauty routine. Shut the fuck up, Catherine. So over the last 13 years since I've developed this condition, I have tried <laughs> everything. I've tried sumatriptan injections, antibody injections, nerve stimulators, every pain medication you can imagine, lidocaine, caffeine, any herbal remedy you could possibly think of, I have tried. Please don't give me suggestions. I know people are always trying to help, but I have tried everything. So, but even if I have treatments like the antibody treatment to to try and prevent it or minimize it, I am constantly just living in fear or in the shadow of another episode coming. That was up until I was able to get these oxygen tanks. These tanks are normal, but there's a special regulator on them that allows for extremely high flow oxygen, like four times, three, four times the amount that like somebody who needed them for, you know, breathing <laughs> would, would get. And breathing in this high level of oxygen for like 10 to 15 minutes constricts your neurovascular system. And for whatever reason, that stops the headache. Like within 10 minutes, I will go from the most unimaginable excruciating pain to completely fine. It just stops. There's no side effects. There's no real risks other than like like putting the mask on and then falling asleep after because that's a common thing where you're literally like basically pass out as soon as the headache is over because you're you're so exhausted. Truly a miracle that will prevent months of suffering in my life. I don't really know why they gave me two of them. I don't need two of them. <laughs> I also have like a fun little like rolling portable oxygen tank too. It's giving breathing. It's giving life. Fortunately, just as I was provided with this miracle for one type of suffering, it came when I had so many brand new fun ways of suffering. Back in early 2023, I had an MRI on my brain as part of the onboarding process for seeing this new neurologist, the one that prescribed me his oxygen tanks. This is just a precautionary measure. And they also wanted to make sure that I had a brain because we were all unsure. So there was almost like no chance that there would be something like a tumor in my brain, which turned out to be true because the tumor was in my spinal cord in my neck. Cool. And this diagnosis came at one of the most horrific times of my life to just add insult to injury, or I guess injury to insult in this case. Because 10 days prior to this diagnosis, my now ex-husband decided to up and leave after uh, I found out he was having an affair with his coworker. Make matters worse, um, this affair started while I was spending 12 hours a day um, in hospice with my mom who was dying of cancer he even brought this coworker to my mom's celebration of life that face when your husband brings the woman he's having an affair with to your mom's funeral um and i promise all of this is extremely true unfortunately and it happened it was unbelievable so back to the mri that was 10 days after he left i so vividly remember getting a call from my neurologist like as soon as I picked up the phone and he said hi can I speak to Catherine I just you just know um when something's bad um and it was obviously because I had a tumor inside my spinal cord that is called a schwannoma it grows off of a nerve and mine just happened to be placed in like the worst possible place it could have been. It was quite large and was significantly compressing my spinal cord 
and had eroded two of my vertebrae, my C2 and my C3 to be specific. So he was like, girl, you, you need to go to neurosurgery because this is, this is going to paralyze you if you don't, or it'll straight up kill you because it was also pushing on one of uh, the most important arteries. Um, in your spine. And I was like, cool, cool, cool. So I went to the first neurosurgeon and he was like, damn, that's crazy. I am not capable of doing this surgery. The second one said the same thing. The third one said the same thing. And that third neurosurgeon at the appointment said he was texting and emailing every single neurosurgeon he knew in the country to try to find somebody who is capable of performing this procedure without killing me. And luckily, it was in Boston, which is only two hours away. Also, this had nothing to do with my cluster headaches, by the way. Completely unrelated to my cluster headaches. Just a massive coincidence that it was close enough to my brain to show up on the MRI. If it had been lower, I still wouldn't know it's there. Uh, Or, well, maybe I would, because I'd probably be, like, paralyzed by now. So, like, kind of weirdly... My cluster headache saved my life. What can I do for you? These are the prominent chest muscles seen on proud bodybuilders. I was like waiting for Ashton Kutcher to pop out at any moment and tell me that I was punked because I went from having a pretty um, stable life to now not having a mom, not having a partner. And now I was staring down the possibility of being paralyzed or dying. When I had the surgery in April down in Boston, they had to cut two of my vertebrae in half, sever a ligament, um, graft a bunch of stuff from my lower back. So I also had this, I have this huge incision on my lower back. They just like remixed all the shit in my spine. I feel so grateful to have survived because like if I didn't have access to an MRI or this was 20 years ago or I didn't have cluster headaches, I'd probably be paralyzed or dead but the recovery from that surgery was horrible (laughs) if i'm being honest as you might imagine it was not fun and i had a cluster headache cycle while i was in a neck brace recovering from this surgery it was unbelievable i remember coming back from boston I i wasn't driving realizing i'm starting to have a cluster headache and i had brought the oxygen tanks with me so we pulled into a burger king outside of boston on route one shout out to that burger king just like i i really wish somebody just had a camera on me because i was crying was breathing in oxygen through this mask in a neck brace um and then immediately eating a bunch of chicken fries as i was starting to get better and starting to get my strength back and returning to normal life i started to decline again I was in, and still am, in immense pain all the time and have crazy numbness. I, like, can't feel my hands or my arms or my neck or my chin half the time. And turns out um, my spine is now just, like, too weak and does not have enough stability. And one of my vertebrae is slipping out of place and pushing on my spinal cord again. So I'm having surgery tomorrow to fuse my spine. The recovery process will be a lot easier. Um, the first surgery I had was quote unquote, the most barbaric kind of surgery, um, they can perform on your spine. According to my surgeon, one of the most difficult things emotionally has been not being able to really make art. Painting specifically was so tied to my identity because I, I learned to paint at such a pivotal moment in my life and continue to do it as a job and my passion and what I felt like was like my calling and just not being able to do that just really made me lose my sense of self. When I laid in bed at my sister's last year after my surgery, unable to lift my arms or get myself in and out of bed, I thought about Frida Kahlo painting from her hospital bed. The parallels felt uncanny to me. She was creating work despite her body being in such worse condition than mine. And I felt a combination of hope and despair. Despair because I wasn't doing shit. I wasn't making anything. I wasn't being the artist 
being the tortured artist channeling my pain into beautiful artwork. I mean, I did beat The Last of Us 1 and 2, so I didn't do nothing. But I felt like I had buckled under the weight of what I was enduring. I couldn't find a way to be beautifully tortured and suffer pretty enough to fulfill this role I had cast myself in. I could not work through the pain. But I did have hope as well because it felt like it wasn't the end of my painting career. It wasn't the end of me being able to make art because there was evidence that somebody else could do it. When people talk about Frida's work, they often see her as this kind of martyr of suffering and romanticize her ability to like overcome her disabilities and her afflictions almost being like well if she didn't suffer we wouldn't have this amazing art it also aligns with other tropes like the heroic disabled person narrative as well as the idea that women need to be beautiful while suffering but the reality is is that Frida wasn't like bolstered by her suffering she just somehow managed to create this work despite her suffering which yes deserves to be celebrated and talked about because it's incredible we are privileged that she granted us passage into her world in such a meaningful way and we are allowed to feel something in response to it, even if you had not gone through something similar. But we can't act like a life filled with horrible pain and suffering that was cut short from her illnesses was anything but that. Nor should we view her capabilities as the norm or the standard for artists. Artistic genius and suffering are often viewed as feeding each other. When we talk about great art, art is not worth being tortured for. And being tortured does not make for great art inherently. It does not make it inherently more meaningful. I personally do not want to be tortured anymore, even if that means I don't make paintings that get me attention and career opportunities and this emotional reaction from people. I want to enjoy my life again, um, especially after this year of just being trapped in this body and going through all of this stuff. I, I don't even know if I want to make art about any of it. At least right now, I just have no, I have no compulsion to, to make art or channel this, these events into art. I want to paint pretty flowers and find something beautiful in my life that I'm privileged to have despite all of these difficulties. I want to live, laugh, love. The last year has been a lesson for me in really stopping and considering what I make and who I make it for, because I haven't been able to really make any art, so I just have... <laughs> I just have to think about it. I don't want to I don't want to romanticize my pain anymore. I don't want to romanticize sadness or make sadness beautiful. It doesn't feel good for me anymore. But like couldn't you say that this video is kind of doing that? I'm I'm dramatizing and making my suffering artistic for the purposes of a video to display to an audience. Aren't I just doing the same thing right now? Thank you so much for watching this video, and thank you to my patrons. Um, I objectively love you more, and so does Twister. So that's not reason alone to sign up. I don't know what it is. I also have like dozens of hours of art guides and process videos and video version of my podcast. You also get your name in the credits of the video, um, which are scrolling by right now. Okay, well, don't give me your pot and then get mad when I grab it. I also forgot to plug uh, my new game that I made. It is called Game Boy Camera Gallery Mystery Show. It's my second game for the Game Boy. 
and it is a virtual exhibition of Game Boy camera photos from a bunch of photographers, and you play as a silly little cat, and it's goofy, campy, horror, mystery narrative. Um, so you can go play it for free over on my itch.io page, or you can buy physical cartridges. And they glow in the dark, so how could you pass that up? Also, I want to thank Left at London for allowing me to use one of her songs, That's Entertainment, for the intro of this video. Okay, thank you. Alright. For me and Twister, signing out. Trauma. 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 Trauma.